I think body weight here was in the here maybe 220 I was on my way up all the way up to 250 which I got really fat and sloppy but you see I started getting bigger here legs started getting bigger I did what all the 90s bodybuilders did here and eat more I was never a junk eater I ate clean it was just a lot more there's a vast difference between unhappy and being satisfied. So you can be happy and can, but not satisfied. Not being satisfied is a good thing because it drives you to be better. So for me, it's like, uh, you know, the artist with the sculpture, it's a sculpture. My body's a sculpture, I'm the artist, but it's a never ending project. It's been going on for two decades. It'll go on for another, hopefully three, you know, so. The pictures were just a part of it. It was a, it was a progress thing. I, I used to look back on them and see how much I progressed. Yeah, it's funny when I think back on it. Everybody has the means. It's all relative to how much it means to them. When something's very important to you, you make it happen. Like, I don't believe in procrastination. It doesn't exist. What do you procrastinate with? You ever procrastinate going out on a date with someone you like? No. You ever procrastinate eating a cheeseburger? No. You procrastinate doing your laundry and paying your bills because you just don't care about those things. So procrastination is, doesn't exist. It's just you do things you like and you don't want to do things you don't like. So if it means a lot to, to them, if it really means a lot being in shape and being healthy, they'll do what it takes. And everyone always asks, what's your motivation? I don't really have any. I think when you truly love what you're doing, that's, that's it. You just love what you're doing and you do it. You don't need an external motivation. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. That's great. I, of course, think about being on stage. I think about winning. I think about progressing, so that drives me. But I don't need an external force of motivation. It's just, it's internal, because I'm doing this for out of love and out of passion. I've been doing it since I was 13, for 20 years before I ever considered stepping on stage. So I'm not necessarily doing this to be in magazines or to be behind the camera, but because I love it. For me, just, this is what I do. If tomorrow I stop competing, I'll still be here. I'll still be doing the same thing. Bring it back down. But I, it's all water weight though. It's all water weight. I'm a fucking water weight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think bodybuilding has progressed for sure because the NPC and the IFBB as a whole has, has grown immensely with all the new divisions. I don't think men's bodybuilding has ever been super mainstream. And just like anything else, just like a muscle car, it's evolved. Bigger, stronger, faster, you know? So bodybuilders have definitely gotten bigger and you know it might not be so mainstream. So it's, it's difficult for the average person to look at bodybuilders and one, relate, or two, understand what goes in to look like that. It's just like, what is that? But I, I don't think body, bodybuilding is like progressing by any means. I think, you know, the excitement is really related to who's in the top five and how close it is. I think classic physique is really cool and exciting and people love it. That being said, the top five was amazing. It was very, very competitive and very, very close. If you move some, some positions around, I mean, I, nobody would really complain. You know, it wasn't like one or two guys were light years ahead of everybody else. So that's what makes any sport exciting. If you watch a football game and it's a washout and you know, it's like 50 to 10, it's not exciting. But when it's really, really close and they're fighting and giving it all and you see it in the athlete's eyes, that's exciting. Hi. Hi, Arsha. Miss you. Hey. Hello. Hi. I was born in Tehran, Iran. Um, we escaped the revolution. And about 1981, we came over to the States. Did you pull up over there? Because he tried to eat it. 
No. I've lived in the U.S. since then, all my life. Uh, with my mother, my father, and my older sister. Arash, I'm very excited uh, about Ohio. What? Oh, yeah? Me too. Oh, yeah. Very excited. I know you're going to win. So my mom and sister are my biggest supporters. They came to the Olympia both and, years. And Chester. And Chester. <laughs> well, Chester's yet to come to a show, but he'll be there. We're going to get him a custom shirt made. Iran is a beautiful country with uh, very deep roots, with uh, art, culture, and food. goes back to the Persian Empire. But unfortunately, Iran underwent a change in government in 79. And the revolution was the Islamic Revolution. Khomeini, Khomeini, they cried. We're waiting for you. I'm the first one in the middle of the time. I'm the first one in the middle of the time. So the Shah was overthrown and the, uh, the country became an Islamic country. So it changed a lot for Iran. It went from a non-Islamic government to an Islamic government. So by law, women have to cover their hair and you know, alcohol is banned and so on and so forth. It's governed by the religion of Islam. So in 2018, I plan to, uh, to visit, see my family, see a lot of the fans, and, um, and see my country. I was born in 1980, and the Islamic Revolution was in 1979, so the borders were closed, and it was a chaotic time. And my family, along with a lot of others, fled. They left the country. So I was literally in a gym bag, go figure, right? We walked out of Iran. Yeah, we walked on foot for seven days. Two, two, my parents hired two guides, these men. Guides. Yeah, and they <laughs> literally walked in the winter in Travel the snow. Agents. I was a baby, I was a year old, and they were, they were melting ice because it was snowing. They, were, they walked through the mountains. They would melt, melt ice and mix it with formula and feed me that. And they walked uh, across the borders and, and got to the States, and that's where I've, I've lived here all my life. So on the way, on the way, they're walking, there's like small old school villages, and they had, they had it in with these villages, they would pay them, the villages, the villagers would hide us during the day, feed us, hide us, and then at night we'd walk. And how long would it tell, tell them about the journey? Will you remember better than us? Um, yes, yeah, seven nights and days. Sometimes when I talk about uh, those days, I think I'm lying. How could I do that? Walk all night where everywhere was white snow and windy and cold. And before the sun uh, was out, we had to be in another village to hide. To hide because their language was different from ours. And those uh, smugglers told us, you don't speak. If they understand you're speaking different language, right away they will call the police, of border police, and they will come and catch us. So we were not allowed to speak loud. And here we are. And you forgot the best part. In the middle of the trip, they robbed my parents and took everything from them, and they abandoned us. Their plan was to take us on top of the mountain, have somewhere where it's in the middle of nowhere, rob us and just leave us to die, and under the snow our bodies would disappear. So we hid in the cave and ate everything until the food <laughs> ran out, almost froze to death, and three days later, yeah. one of the guys felt guilty because of you and me and mommy, because he's like, if you didn't have kids and a wife, I would have left you to die. After three days when we ran out of food, and that's when they were melting the ice and giving it to you, because they ran out of formula. Um, and we were nearly freezing to death, he came back, one guy, and said, I'm just gonna, just shut up, I'm just gonna get you to, like, there's only a few days left. We but when we, find. but he, again, he, he, he threatened daddy and said, if you don't give me money when we get there, I don't care how you get it, I still won't take you, but I felt bad and I came back, I want more money. <laughs> I, I always think sometimes, like what would I be doing? Where would I be? Would I be bodybuilding? Would I be doing something different if I never came to the States, you know? But, um, they came, my parents brought me and my sister here for a better life, and here I am now. Like people say, if you're a painter, it doesn't matter where you're born, where you're, you're raised, I don't believe that, because every single one of us, who we are today, a big part of it is our environment, who we were raised around, our friends, our family, media, everything. So maybe I still would have been a bodybuilder, maybe she still would have been an artist, maybe not. You know, and not only, I think the desire would be there still, 
but would our environment allow us to blossom like we did? Yeah. I don't know. New York is Iran doesn't have the, world. the capabilities, you know, doesn't the people youth in Iran don't have the opportunities that we have here. So, you know, we're a perfect example of parents bringing their kids to America for a better life, you know. So this was about after three or four years of bodybuilding, creatine, protein shakes, and eating six meals a day. And you know, this is my mom's bedroom back then. You could see I had the dip bar, pull-up bar, and the boxing bag in the back. So this is the same, same so time. So when Arsh was, was eight years old, he started uh, karate. There was a class in um, Little Neck, Northern Boulevard. And then we moved to San Diego, and he continued uh, the same sport for two more years. And we then came back to New York, and that's when he started football. And he bought a new refrigerator, and he had his uh, own chicken and vegetable, and, and he would make his own food. And I bought him a few weights that he was lifting. He was very popular. I remember one time we ordered a cake for a restaurant. Um, in a bakery in Great Neck. And when I went to pick it up, as soon as I set the cake for this restaurant, the girl behind the counter started screaming. <laughs> Seriously, and this I happened. Said, what happened? <laughs> are you okay? What happened to you? And she said, are you Arsh's mom? Are you Arsh's mom? <laughs> okay. Everything was so planned and organized at such a young age and I don't and the thing is this is this is intuition this is passion this is dense destiny where you don't know what the hell you're doing and it's not easy but you just you're just going down this path and it's super dark in the end but you just you you do it anyway not knowing where it's all gonna lead I just knew that I wanted to change the way my physique looked and I wanted to continue to grow and improve and get better. So a lot of guys say, yeah, I worked out in high school too, but I wasn't just working out, I was bodybuilding. You know, I was making sure I was sleeping, I was training six days a week in high school. You know, I was doing everything in my power that I knew and I kept studying and reading, studying and reading, training, studying, reading, training. I have no doubt that this is what he was meant to do. I mean, that I'm clear about that. He's so disciplined by nature. Everything he did, he did it to his, the best of his ability. He just, he takes it to that, to the point where he's, he's, he, he's breaking and then he pushes harder. This was an obsession from the beginning. It was an obsession. He couldn't not do this. If you're willing to bleed for it, then you know you're in the, in the right field. Then you know you're doing the right thing. If it's not your passion or your true, true love in life, it's not that important. And you're not gonna work that hard and you're not gonna be the best. If you're great, people will see. You know, if you're good, people will see. Just do what you do, keep your head down, work hard, and people will see you for who you truly are. One, two, three, good.